Okay, now let's work through some examples. And let me remind you that on any of these, if you want time to try and think over or work through any of these before I give the solutions, you can always pause the video. Okay, suppose that the factored form of a polynomial looks like this, what you see on your screen or what you're looking at if you have a copy of the notes for this section. What are the zeros of this polynomial? So this is where you would pause if you want a second to think about it. So the zeros are, well, the four is not a zero. The four is just out there being a four. But we have an x minus seven factor, so seven is a zero. We have an x plus three factor, so negative three is a zero. We have x minus four plus three i, so the complex number four plus three i is a zero. We have a factor that says x minus four minus three i, so the complex number four minus three i is a zero. We have another factor of x plus three, so negative three shows up again. And we have a factor of x minus two, so two is a zero. Negative three showed up twice, its multiplicity is two. So we got five different zeros, but counting multiplicity, we had six zeros of this polynomial. So what is the degree? Six. If you said six, you were right. There are six of these x factors, and there are six zeros counting multiplicity. If a polynomial of degree four has zeros negative one, two, four i, and negative four i, what does it look like in factored form? Here's the answer. For negative one to be a zero, x plus one has to be a factor. For two to be a zero, x minus two has to be a factor. For four i to be a zero, x minus four i has to be a factor. And for negative four i to be a zero, x plus four i has to be a factor. So that's what it is in factored form. Now, since I just said, what does it look like in factored form? That would be the answer to that question. But if we go ahead and multiply this out, I can use FOIL to multiply these first two factors together. I can multiply the last two factors together. At this point, here's what it looks like. Then I can multiply these two polynomials together. Well, before I do that, the i squared, remember, is negative one. So instead of writing minus 16 i squared, I can write minus negative or plus positive 16. And now when I multiply these together, x squared times x squared is x to the fourth, minus x times x squared is minus x cubed, minus x times 16 is minus 16x, we got a minus 2x squared, we got a plus 16x squared, we got a minus 32. After combining like terms in multiplied out form, it's x to the fourth minus x to the third plus 14x squared minus 16x minus 32. How many zeros could the polynomial function f of x equals 3x to the fifth minus x to the third minus 8x squared plus 27 have? Well, what's the degree? Five. So how many zeros could it have? Five. In fact, we could say that counting multiplicity, it has to have exactly five. But that doesn't mean it has to have five different zeros. It could have five different zeros, or it could have more than one of the same thing. Next example, write an equation for which one, three, and five are solutions. How about this? X minus one times X minus three times X minus five equals zero. You plug in one for x, you get zero times this other stuff equals zero. You can plug in three for x and you have zero times other stuff equals zero. You can plug in five for x and get zero. So for each solution, we've got a factor. And I could have said, write a polynomial for which one, 
3 and 5 are zeros. Solutions to an equation are pretty much the same thing as zeros to a polynomial when you're talking about polynomial equations. So in factored form, your polynomial would be x minus 1 times x minus 3 times x minus 5. And then if we multiplied that out, first of all, x minus 1 times x minus 3 would be x squared minus 4x plus 3. And then when we multiply that times x minus 5, and combine like terms, we end up with x to the third minus 9x squared plus 23x minus 15. So there's a polynomial, and you can check if you want. You can plug in 1 or 3 or 5 and evaluate it, and the value of the polynomial comes out to be 0. Now notice something. The 15 that we got on the end here came from multiplying the 1 times the 3 and then that 3 times the 5. So the zeros, 1 and 3 and 5, are all factors of this constant term, 15. 15 is divisible by 1, 3, and 5. So if I had just given you this polynomial here, it would have been reasonable to guess that maybe numbers like 1 or 3 or 5 could be zeros of this polynomial, but numbers like 2 or 4 or 7 could not be, because like for 2 to be a 0, x minus 2 would have had to be one of the factors, and then when we multiplied it all out, that constant term would have involved 2 times something else, but it would have had a factor of 2. So that's the idea behind the rational zero test. Another example, earlier we looked at 4x to the third minus 15x squared minus 31x plus 30. That was in the earlier video. The zeros of that were 5, negative 2, and 3 fourths. Notice that 5 is a factor of 30, and that negative 2 is a factor of 30. And what about 3 fourths? Well, the 3 on top is a factor of 30, and the 4 on the bottom, that's the leading coefficient. That's a factor of 4. So here's what's true in general. If a polynomial function has all integer coefficients, then any zeros of that polynomial that are rational numbers must be of the form a factor of the constant term over a factor of the leading coefficient. Like in that last example, a factor of 30 over a factor of 4, like 5 over 1 or negative 2 over 1 or 3 over 4. So, that doesn't tell you for sure what the zeros of a polynomial have to be, but it tells you some possibilities for what they could be. It gives you a list of possibilities, and it lets you rule out all the rational numbers that are not on that list. So for example, list the possible rational zeros of the polynomial function f of x equals 5x cubed, minus 14x squared plus 9x plus 35. Notice our constant term is 35, and our leading coefficient is 5. The factors of the constant term are positive or negative 1, 5, 7, and 35. Those are the only factors, the only integers that 35 is divisible by. And the factors of the leading coefficient are positive or negative 1 or 5. Those are the only things that 5 is divisible by. So the possible rational zeros come from taking the factors of the constant term over the factors of the leading coefficient. We can have 1 over 1, 5 over 1, 7 over 1, 35 over 1, 1 over 5, 5 over 5, 7 over 5, 
or 35 over 5. And in each case, it could be either positive or negative. So really, that means we have the possibilities are 1, 5, 7, 35, 1 fifth, and then, well, 5 over 5 would just be 1, which is already on the list, 7 fifths, and then 35 over 5 would just be 7, and that's already on the list. So here's our list of possibilities. So any rational number that is a zero of that polynomial would have to be on this list. That means that we can rule out things like two or three or one half. Now we can't rule out that there might not be some irrational zeros, like the square root of something or imaginary or complex zeros involving i, they wouldn't be on this list. But there may or may not be zeros like that, but any of the zeros that are rational numbers, either whole numbers or fractions, positive or negative, these are the only things they could be. Let's try another example. List the possible rational zeros of 3x cubed plus 11x squared minus 6x minus 8. So we need to focus on the constant term and the leading coefficient. And the possibilities are plus or minus 1 over 1, 2 over 1, 4 over 1, 8 over 1, 1 over 3, 2 over 3, 4 over 3, or 8 over 3 because we have to have one of the factors of the constant term, one, two, four, or eight, over one of the factors of the leading coefficient, one or three. So let's stop this video there, and then we'll pick up in the next one with some more examples where we use this to help us actually find zeros of some polynomials. See you then.